one of the great perks of ministering is performing baptisms. It's always a joyful occasion to have a church full of people celebrating with new Christians. Often after a baptism, parents have everyone over to their home for festivities. I can remember many good meals at the home of parishioners, babies napping in white gowns after the exhaustion of water on their head, older children racing through the house, godparents relating how cute the baby's burp sounded as she was carried to the font, parents frazzled but happy. Baptism is an important day, and it only makes sense that it is honored with proper attention and fanfare. So when Jesus was baptized, you'd assume that his father would have made a big deal of it. Trumpets would blow, parades would march, the heavens would sing. In fact, the opposite occurs. In today's reading, no sooner does God the Father announce, you are my son, when immediately the Holy Spirit drives Jesus into the wilderness for 40 days. You get the sense that his hair is still damp from the baptism as he is forcibly pushed into the dry heat of the desert. No cake and baptism celebration for his son. God sends Jesus to endure a test instead. But Jesus is not alone. There are others involved in this drama. There are angels tending to him. In fact, angels appear only one other time in the entire Gospel of Mark, and that is at the empty tomb to announce his resurrection. Another participant is, of course, the Holy Spirit, who forcibly begins this chapter of Christ's journey. This is her only appearance in Mark's Gospel. There is Satan as well. In fact, there are demons and unclean spirits throughout Mark, but this is the only time that Satan appears as a character. It's a sign of the importance of this event that three different spiritual forces, the Holy Spirit, Satan, and angels are all present in this chapter at once. For two of them, it's their only time in the whole book. Something important is happening in the wilderness. There is a cosmic battle at play. Why would Satan, angels, and the Holy Spirit all converge on Jesus at this time? Well, for one thing, they all know who he is. At this point in the story, other than John the Baptist, no human yet knows Jesus' identity. But the cosmic forces of the world know that Jesus is the Son of God and has a particular mission to accomplish, and they are leaping into the struggle, either for or against. The angels want Jesus to succeed, while Satan, of course, wants Jesus to fail. The Holy Spirit, though, is a little harder to figure out. Presumably, she wants Jesus to succeed, but then why does she drive him, virtually pushing Jesus out into the desert in the first place? The answer is found in the Greek word used for tempted. It can also be translated as tested. God is testing Jesus while Satan tempts. The difference in these two is that God does not want Jesus to fail while Satan does. God is using this wilderness time as an important test for Jesus, a period of strengthening resolve and commitment for the mission ahead, a time of deepening faith. The angels and Holy Spirit are facilitating this while Satan thwarts. And this tension between the two and its resolution will clarify for Jesus his path forward. The wilderness serves a purpose. In the end, Jesus doesn't sin. He passes the test. And so in the cosmic battle for Christ's actions, the angelic forces succeed. But in this, Christ is a model for us. We too have wilderness periods in our lives. We too are tempted to sin. Jesus gives us some guidance for coping with these things. Because 
The Christian life is not a guarantee that everything is always hunky-dory. Sometimes life is great. We feel good about ourselves and our world. Other times, we find ourselves in a pit of despair. A personal wilderness experience can make us feel that the world is against us, against us and that we are alone. Like Jesus, we too are pursued by wild beasts. And in our pain, we are tempted to take shortcuts to alleviate that pain. Are you arguing with your kids? Kick the dog. In a bad marriage, try an affair. Short on cash, cheat on your taxes. Passed over for a promotion at work, Slander the guy who passed you over. It's much easier to resist sin when life is going well. It's much harder when it's not. And even if you do manage to resist temptation, you're still in the wilderness. You're still stuck in this dark place with no obvious end. You're still in the place that T.S. Eliot describes as where, quote, the dead tree gives no shelter, the cricket no relief, and the dry stone no sound of water, end quote. That is why, as for Jesus, prayer and calling upon the angels and love of God to sustain us can give us relief in our desert, in our wilderness. We don't need to go it alone. And in the end, there is a payoff. Jesus, in the course of his 40 days of testing, was deepened spiritually. And after he completed his mission, concluding with his death on the cross, he revealed the kingdom of God. The wilderness experience was necessary in order to bring about new life. And so it can be for us as well. I remember a number of years ago visiting a dear friend of mine in Phoenix. As you know, Phoenix is in the desert. It consists largely of dusty ground, dry scrub, and cacti. Their desert is particularly famous for their saguaro cacti, the ones that grow up to 50 feet tall, and with they sort of straight up with just one or two arms on them. And they usually live for 150 years. I visited this desert one March during Lent and discovered that this was their rainy season. Now, this doesn't mean rain like we find in Massachusetts. It means only a month or so of brief showers. But it is enough to change the desert. One afternoon, I took a walk through a national park and was delighted to discover wildflowers. All year long, the seeds and life are hidden but when the rains come, the sweet, delicate little flowers burst forth their one quick chance to shine. It was such a juxtaposition to see this huge cactus, fierce spines jutting out, surrounded at its base with bunches of colorful flowers. It makes me think of the Christian life. We all have our desert times, our wilderness times when we experience cactus spines and parched earth. But as Christians, through prayer, through inviting in the love of God into our lives and into our hearts, we can also see the flowers. The desert is still the desert. Being a Christian doesn't make that go away. But we have the insight to know that that is not all there is. We see signs of more abundant life. We know that we are not left to the wild beasts. We are surrounded by angels and the Holy Spirit. And we need just call on them. And like the Christ, we will get to the other side of the desert, of our time in the desert, and find an even more wonderful place. Because the wilderness tests us, but it also strengthens us. It gives us wisdom and compassion. 
It teaches us that we are not independent, but dependent on God. There are flowers to be found in the desert and new life when we have safely passed through it. Amen.